Pastor Jeff. Amen. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Acts, week 26, actually uh, chapter 26, excuse me. Before we start, let's just pray for Dee. Can we do that? Father, I just thank you tonight, and I pray right now that you just touch D, Lord. Let her know that this study is praying for, Lord God. I pray that your hand of mercy would just be there for, Lord God. Lord, to calm her emotions, Lord Jesus. Lord, to heal her physically, Lord. Bless her now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. I probably wasn't going to say anything to you, but I need you to, uh, to remember me in prayer, too. It's nothing serious. I'm, I'm actually playing Mr. Noah this week. My wife is right now, Cheryl's right now on her way to Ireland. With our, with our daughter. She's in the air on the way to Ireland for a vacation with my daughter. And um, I'm taking care of the t her two dogs, the new puppy, two birds, the cat, and the fish. So please pray that I don't let anything die when she's gone. It won't be good in the Carell house if that happens. All right, let me tell you what my title is tonight. It's Having Christ Esteem. How many of you ever heard of self-esteem? Well, this is having Christ esteem. I believe it's going to touch a lot of people tonight. And I'll get to it eventually. I'm going to touch it a little bit in our study of it first. But then I'm going to get to it eventually and really kind of sit, uh, zero in on it. We're in the very last stages of the book of Acts. We are going through the books of Acts. Somebody asked, well, what are we going to do after Acts? Well, after Acts, we're going to do the life of Christ. That, excuse me. We're going to do uh, the psalm study. I wrote three books on it. And we'll have those books available also. But we're going to do the, uh, the psalm study. And the psalm study is actually a prophecy of Israel. So we're going to do that, that uh, based on those books. So you'll see that. And uh, we're very excited about doing that. But we're at the end, almost at the end of the book of Acts. And we're about to accompany Paul in his last journey to Rome itself. And so Paul is what we've been concentrating on. Now we've watched Paul and we've watched what's happened in Acts. This is a brief review. Acts 1 to 6 is the church at Jerusalem. Chapter 7, Stephen's speech and martyrdom. Chapter 8, persecution dispersed of the church. Chapter 9, Paul starts to enter. He encounters risen Christ. Peter proclaims the gospel to the Gentiles in chapter 10. The mission to the Gentiles is authenticated in chapter 11. And then basically you're going to start seeing all Paul uh, at this part. A uh, mission to uh, Herod Agrippa's persecution and death. Chapter 13, journey one, a circuit through Asia Minor and back to Antioch. Chapter 15, Jerusalem Council on the Gentiles. Chapters 15 to 18, journey two, second missionary journey of Paul and Silas. Chapters 18 to 20, the third missionary journey. Look how far we've gone. Chapters 21 to 23, a trap and arrest and spirited to safety. And now we're at the very last phase, chapter 24 to 28, which will be the journey uh, for Paul to Rome. So we're in chapter 26, and uh, let me give you the summary of the last several chapters so you understand it in detail. Chapter 21, Paul was arrested. We've been in his, these are arrest chapters. 22, the defense to the mob in Jerusalem. You remember that. Paul tried in Jerusalem, plot to kill Paul. 23, 24, Paul is before the governor Felix. 25, Paul is before Festus, who, who uh, replaces Felix, and he appeals to Caesar. 26, Paul is before Agrippa, and that's where we are tonight, by the way. 27, journey to Rome begins, shipwreck at Malta. 28, Paul bitten by a snake, and he arrives in Rome. So we're very, very close to Paul being at the center, the epicenter of where, of where all the world is starting to wonder after Rome itself. We pick it up after Agrippa gives Paul permission to speak, and Paul outlines why he is standing before him accused of the Jews. We saw that last week, Paul speaking. He's very eloquent in his speaking, and God is obviously giving him a bunch of things to say. And so we're going we're gonna to pick it up where we left off last, ne last week in Acts chapter 26, verse 24. At this point, Festus interrupted Paul's defense. You'll remember that Festus and his wife were there, and Agrippa, King Agrippa, a Jew, and his wife Bernice are there, and they're looking at Paul, and he's coming out again to defend himself for the third time. At this point, Festus interrupts Paul's defense. You're out of your mind, Paul. He shouted, your great learning is driving you insane. I'm not insane, most excellent Festus, Paul replied. What I'm saying is true and reasonable. The king is, this is Agrippa, is familiar with these things, and I can speak freely to him. I'm convinced that none of this has escaped his notice because it was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. Now, we're going to take that apart in a moment, but let me go a little bit further. This is some of the parts that you're probably familiar with. It says this, Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And Paul said, I would to God that not only thou, but also all that hear me this day, were both almost and altogether such as I am, except these bonds. So those are the immortal words that Paul says to Agrippa. But I really want to take those apart and tell you exactly what he's talking about. Paul had what we call, I call, Christ esteem. Not self-esteem, Christ esteem. There's a big difference. A great difference between self-esteem and Christ esteem. The second, Christ esteem, makes possible the first. 
But the first, without the second, is misplaced pride. So you will see this before you leave here tonight. The joy from loving ourselves as accepted, valued, and cherished people comes from Christ. And trust me, you have to love yourself. If you don't love yourself, there's no way you can love your neighbor. The Bible says, love your neighbor as yourself. So if you don't like yourself, you're not going to like your neighbor. So you have to love yourself. Now, not, and, you, and the joy from loving ourselves as accepted and valued and cherished people comes from Christ. It doesn't come from the world. It doesn't come from the image the world pushes on us, or even our own image of ourselves. That, doesn't come, that joy doesn't come from how you view yourself. You're your own worst critic. He is the only source, Christ is, of lasting delight and being the unique, never-to-be-repeated miracle each of us are. Eight billion people on the planet. There is no one like you. No one. You are unique. God's made you unique. He knew you before you were in your mother's womb. He has a destiny for you. And so when we understand that, and hopefully we can start to see ourselves, not through our own eyes, but through the eyes of Christ. Christ's esteem is being able to say with Paul, I would to God that you might become such as I am. Paul is talking, I'm going to tell you this in a little bit more detail. He's talking to a king and a Roman governor. And he's saying, my wish is that you were like me. That's a powerful thing to say to a king and to a Roman governor. Uh, Self-condemnation and guilt are going to hurt you. If you know Jesus, then you know that he has liberated you from self-condemnation and he's liberated you from guilt. If you're not yet liberated from that, I'll give you a prayer later to say, to help remind you that you are liberated from any guilt of past sins. We may say it, but sometimes we carry those with us. Sometimes I can see people that are depressed or sometimes they're held back by their own thoughts of what they can't do. How many are with me tonight? Or their own limitations. They hold themselves back. You're doing yourself a disservice. We, all of us, are doing ourselves a disservice whenever we do that. And a good test to know if you are accepted, uh, if you've accepted that liberation, is the degree to which you want everyone to become as you are. If you are full of joy, and if you are accepting what God's done for you, then it's going to overflow, and you're going to want everybody to be like you. But if you're not real crazy about yourself, you're not going to really want anybody to be like you. You know, you're going to say, be like me. How many, how many understand? How many of us can stand before a president or stand before a, or somebody that's a dignitary and say, I wish that you were just like me? That's what Paul said. That's exactly what Paul said. It wasn't pride. It was Christ esteem. And we'll, again, we'll explain that in a moment. So that's what Paul's saying. And that's at the heart of the Great Commission. Why do you want to share something? Why would you want to share misery with somebody else? If you're miserable as a Christian, do you want to share that with somebody else? You don't want to share your misery. You want to share the joy of Christ. Somebody say amen. amen. So, accept Christ and be free like I am free. Be forgiven like I'm forgiven. Be unjudged of your past sins like I'm unjudged of my past sins. The person who's, who is excited about the new, per, the new person God has made them will be passionate to see that change happen in others and will consequently be a great witness of the gospel of truth. I remember when I first got saved. When I first got saved, I had a cocaine business. I was running cocaine on the floorboards of my SS Camaro from Penn State to, to Hazleton, Pennsylvania, about a two-hour drive. I remember I got saved. I went back home. I called all my friends up who wanted to, who usually come over and give me money for a nickel bag of, 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 uh, of weed or for cocaine or for whatever. I called them all up. They thought, I had a, they thought I had a score. They were coming over my house. I called them up one by one. I scheduled them to come in my house. Most of them knew me from when I was in grade school. They were my friends. They all knew my mother. She had cooked for a whole bunch of them. They would come in my house. My mother knew what I was doing. She never stopped me. But they would come in my house. I sat them down on my kitchen table and I witnessed to them. And I told them, I'm saved now. I've gotten no, some of them didn't even know what it was. So I'm going to church and I'm never going to do cocaine again. I'm never going to do any, any drugs again. And I'm never going to the bars with you again. And if you want to see me again, you've got to come to church with me. 105 people. 105. Some of them would walk out of my house telling my mother, he's insane. He's crazy. My mother would say, you know what my mother would say? I know. I have no idea what happened to him. She actually told me at one point that she liked me better before I was saved. Came from a very unsafe house. Why? I was actually telling them, I want you to be like me. 
I was so imperfect, it wasn't even funny. But I had Christ esteem. How many know what we're talking about? Something happened to me and I want to share it with others. This is the whole idea of the Great Commission. You're excited about what God gave to you. Maybe we need that back in the church, don't you think? We need people to get excited what God's done so that we can share that excitement. The person who's excited about the new person God has made them, let me repeat it, will be passionate to see that change happen in others. And so was I. By the way, two of those men, two of those men gave their hearts to the Lord in my kitchen and they're both pastors today. Two of them. So I want you to understand. Two. So many Christians are down on themselves. They never have accepted themselves, so they find it hard to accept others. Look, the more joy you have in what Jesus has done in your life, the more you'll draw people that want that same joy. The world doesn't want to hear about your problems. Do you ever hear somebody that comes up to you that, you know, there's some people, and don't, don't feel bad if you have to share something with me, because it's okay. I'm a pastor. I have big shoulders. But do you ever be around people that all they want to do is tell you how bad they have it? But they always, that's all they want to do. They want to tell you how bad they have it. And, you know, and sometimes there's people, they can't wait until they're done so they can tell them back how bad they have it. It's like they haven't heard anything they said. They just want to get them finished so they can tell them how bad they have it. You know what I'm talking about. It's actually the, uh, the theme of the book that Paul would write to the Philippian believers about joy and rejoicing. Rejoicing is a form of joy. Philippians is all about it. The joy of knowing Christ and making him known. That's what all Philippians is about. You can see it from one side to the other. Here's a key word in it. The key word in Philippians is rejoicing. If you're feeling down, read Philippians. Study Philippians. Uh, rejoicing. It's a part of joy. Key verse, Philippians 4.4. 4. I'll show it to you in a moment. Key phrase, the joy of the Christian unity should be preserved. Paul says, you should keep this joy among you. This is what gathers people together. People in the world don't have joy. They may have happiness. They may buy a, buy a trip to the Bahamas. That may give them a little happiness. They may get a new house. That's a little happiness. But that's not real joy. Joy is not situational. Joy isn't the fact that something... I could have joy when they told me that I had stage 4 cancer. I wasn't happy about it. But I had joy because I still knew Christ was there. And if I lived, I was His. If I died, I was His. So you can have joy beyond your circumstances. Most people in America... Don't, in the world, don't have joy. You can only have joy through Jesus Christ. And it all goes back to our Christ esteem. What we feel about ourselves in Jesus. Not about the size of your bank account. Not about the size dress you wear, ladies. Or how big your nose is. Or how short or tall you are. Or how much you weigh. Or how many degrees you have or you don't have. All that has been fed to us by a self-esteem conscious world. Self-esteem. They want you to look a certain way. They want you to act a certain way. They want you to buy a certain product. That's all manipulated on us to get us to try to get into an image. God does not care about that image. I want you to know that. God doesn't care if you're five pounds overweight. Now, you may want to take care of your body. I understand that. But trust me, He doesn't care if you're five pounds overweight. He doesn't care if you think your nose is big. He doesn't care. God cares about your Christ esteem. How many are with me today? Our real joy comes from what and how Jesus views us. Paul was probably a bald, bowed over, almost blind, older man at the time. So imagine him standing in front of this king. He has an amazing Christ esteem. So much so that he can tell Agrippa, who by the way, we read it to you last week, he was well adorned. He came in with an entourage. He probably has gold rings all over his fingers. He probably has a gold necklace on. He probably has a gold staff. He comes in, he's, he's well polished. He understands the procedures of court. He's standing in front of Agrippa, and he's standing in front of the Roman governor, Festus, who's been personally appointed by a Caesar. This man knows people. This man's high up. He understands the, the hierarchy. And he says to both of them, I wish you were just like me. <laughs> I love it. I just, you've got to love that. What's, what's motivating this guy? What's pushing this guy to say this? Paul's delight in Jesus filled him with confident courage and enthusiasm. Apparently, he became so excited and passionate about the gospel, he was proclaiming that both Agrippa and Festus were forced to respond. I'll read it to you again. The issue of his guilt became secondary, as both were drawn into the magnetism of Paul's words and the fourth force with which he spoke them. Paul's telling them something, and they both start to say something. They feel compelled to have to say something. Look, look. Luke tells us Festus had to raise his voice to get to Paul. Before I get there, let me show you the, the Philippian verses. Uh, so if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy, my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord of one another. Complete God's joy, His joy. Listen, it's all, it says this in 4.4. Rejoice in the Lord always. 
I will, I will say it again, rejoice. That word rejoice is a word formed around the word joy. Have joy in the Lord always. Make sure your joy is always full. Now, is there, are there things in the world that will pull your joy away or try to? Absolutely. The enemy knows that your joy is one of the most important things in your life. The joy in Christ will give you your Christ esteem. If you don't have Christ esteem, you're going to go right down the tubes on the situations of life. How many are still with me tonight? So, we see that they have to raise their voice. In Acts 26, 24, while Paul was saying this in his defense, Festus said in a loud voice, he's screaming at Paul, Paul, you're out of your mind. Your, your great learning is driving you mad. You're insane, Paul. He has to yell at Paul to get over Paul. How many of you know that Paul is probably more anointed than you could possibly imagine at this point? Paul's bouncing off the walls at this point, and they think he's mad. So uh, he suggested Paul was mental. The governor was obviously stirred up by the apostle, but Paul wasn't mad. He wasn't mad. Not crazy, I'm just convinced. That's what he was. Now listen. Festus' accusations then gave Paul the opportunity to draw the net around King Agrippa. You'll find out that, that Paul doesn't answer Festus be, of him being mad. He ignores it, and he starts to concentrate on King Agrippa. It's an extremely smart move. For the king had been the target of his message all along. Paul was directing it right at him. So we see something going on here. Festus... The Roman governor didn't have the knowledge about these things that Agrippa did. He didn't know anything about Christianity. He, didn't know he was new on, the island, new on the land. He didn't know anything about the way. probably didn't know anything about Jesus. Almost everything Paul said went against everything that Festus had been taught. He was a pagan. He didn't believe in, the, in, this, in this, uh, these gods, these uh, new religions, these myths, he called them. Like many today, he believed that once dead, always dead. None but the most naive of the pagans really believed the myths of the mystery religions. Judaism was a mystery religion to the pagans. But Paul knew that Agrippa knew the prophecies and that he believed them. He was a Jew. Agrippa was a Jew. So he knew that he, that he believed them. Paul ignored the charge of being mad by Festus and with increased zeal, he turned to Agrippa for validation. And listen to it, it's masterful. The word Festus, by the way, used for the, was the Greek word menei, it, which we get our word mania, mania from and our word maniac. So Festus was saying, Paul, you're, you're manic. You're a maniac. But Festus had made the wrong diagnosis. Paul's enthusiasm and zeal wasn't a manic high. It was an anointed zeal and a joy. I remember preaching one time at, at my church, at cathedral. And uh, how many of you ever heard me preach? How many have never heard me preach? How many have never heard me preach? My preaching is totally different than my teaching. In my preaching, I foam. If I'm wearing a tie, if I'm wearing a tie, my kids would say this. They'd say, Dad, if they weren't at service, which was very rare, they'd look at my tie after the service and they'd say, wow, that must have been a good message today. I'd say, how could you tell? Because your sweat is down to this. It was like a barometer for them. You must have really been. When I preach, I just let it go. Someone, I remember preaching one time and there was a little boy in the front row and the uh, church was filled, a couple thousand people. And the little boy's in the front row and I was preaching and, and I get excited when I preach. It's not something, com it's just something that comes on me. I get excited about the Word of God. Um, people have told me it's because I'm Italian. People told me it's because I'm, I'm a, um, I have an A-type personality. It's because I get excited about the Word of God. Amen. And so this little boy, the whole service was like this. <laughs> I went down to him after the service and I said, he was a visitor with his mom. His mom loved the service. And uh, I said to him, I said, are you okay? And he said, yeah. I said, well, we could pray for your ears. And he says, no. He says, I'm okay. He says, I don't even have to question. I want to ask a question. I said, okay. He's probably about six or seven. He said, why? <laughs> I said, why? He says, why? He says, why you run? Why you get red? Why you yell? And I said, I can't explain it. I'll talk to you later about it. When you get passionate about the Word of God, it takes, it takes over. It's not you, you don't think about it. It takes over. I remember preaching after I had cancer and I came back, I preached my first message here. My second message I preached in a church in Gardendale. And when I was preaching that message, I was talking about Elijah and it, the platform was about this high. Some of you were there. The platform was about that high. How many remember this? And what I did is I did a somersault off the platform. My head was still bald from chemotherapy. I was just getting over everything and I just did a full flip with my Bible in my hand and landed on my feet. My son and all my family was there. My son came up to me and he looked at me afterwards and he says, what are you thinking? <laughs> I said, I'm not. You know, 
That's the, when the anointing hits, you let the anointing hit. You don't think about it. You just do it. This is Paul. He's anointed. He is, he is, he is affecting everybody that's around him. This is why he's so powerful. Festus had made the wrong diagnosis. And so Paul masterfully shifts from Festus's charge to Agrippa's confirmation of what he's saying. Listen to what Paul does. It's masterful. He says this, uh, For the king before whom I also speak freely. From Agrippa. Agrippa, I'm speaking. You told me I could speak freely. He says, You know these things. For I'm convinced that none of these things escape your attention, since this thing was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. Now, this is what he's saying. King Agrippa, he turns for Fest, he says, King Agrippa, you know what I'm talking about. You understand what's happening. You know exactly what I'm doing. This was not done in the corner. You came here knowing exactly who I am. You know exactly what's going on in Christianity. You also know about me and why I'm here and what I've done and who I am. And I, I wasn't done in a corner. You're the king of Judea. You knew this was done. Come on, Grippa. You know about Jesus and you know about the Christian movement. I know you know. That's what he's telling him. Yeah. Paul trapped Agrippa. How did he trap him? He asked him if he believed in the prophets. If he said no, then his credibility with the listening Jewish chief rabbis that were all around would have gone straight downhill. If he said yes, then Paul could have asked him if he was ready to accept the Messiah that they had prophesied about, the prophets, and came in fulfilled and fulfilled their exact prophecies. Agrippa was well versed in Hebrew Bible. He was well versed in the Torah. He knew the prophecies. Paul could have said, come on Agrippa. There's over 300 Old Testament prophecies, and you know that there are talks about where Messiah is going to be born. Talks about the time of his birth. Talks about the manner of his birth. Talks about his betrayal. Talks about the manner of his death. Talks about people's reactions. It talks about piercing his side. Remember the Psalter I told you about last week? Psalm 22. It says that many bulls have compassed me, strong bulls of Bashan have beset me wrong. They gaped upon me with, my, with their mouths as a raving and a roaring lion. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It's melted at the midst of my bowels. They cast lots for my vesture. They pierce my hands and my feet. Come on, that's a crucifixion fiction statement from Christ that was written by David a thousand fifty years before Christ was born. He could have said, Agrippa, you know that. Who's that talking about? Don't you remember Agrippa? And didn't you see Jesus crucified that way? Didn't you know that Micah said that he came from Bethlehem? He would come from Bethlehem? Don't you know that Jesus came from Bethlehem? No, you know he came from Bethlehem. You know about him. So he's, he's trapping Agrippa. By the way, the probability of any one person fulfilling all eight of those prophecies is one in ten to the seventeenth power. That's one in one hundred with all those zeros. And so, uh, uh, Beth the mathematician did something also. We know born of a virgin, descendant of Abraham, tribe of Judah, house of David, born of Bethlehem, taken of Egypt, Herod killing the infants. We know that all those things were prophesied. The mathematician did this. His name was Stoner. An expert in the area of mathematical probabilities, Peter Stoner, wrote in the Science Speaks that if all the eight of the prophecies in the Old Testament concerning Christ were fulfilled, the probability of their actual coming to pass would be that number, 1 in 10 to the 17th degree. But could Jesus have merely fulfilled these prophecies by accident? No. One in that, that one gives you that full number. Here it is. The odds of winning the lottery are 1 in 259 billion. The odds of a man fulfilling eight prophecies is this. One in all of those zeros. Jesus not only didn't fill eight, he filled, fulfilled 300 of them. There's no other way, no other person, no other thing. It had to be Christ. And Grippa knew it. He knew that Paul knew what he was talking about. So just think about it because we're going towards where Grippa is going to respond. Uh, so we can be sure that the leaders of the Israel leaned forward to listen intently to, to Agrippa's response. Well, what would he say? Would he say he did believe the prophets or he didn't believe the prophets? And Agrippa's response was this, which I read to you. He said this. He said, Agrippa said to Paul, almost, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. That's not exactly what the Greek says. It's a good translation, but it's not the exact translation. Let me give you the exact translation. The Greek original words for almost is the word oligio. It means in a little time or in a brief time. A more accurate translation would be this. Then Agrippa said to Paul, do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? Now, it's interesting. What Agrippa meant and what he was saying is, in this short time, Paul, you just talking, you want me to make or you want to persuade me to become a Christian and make that decision right now? Well, what Agrippa was really saying was something like this. Either, Paul, I want to think about this, or Paul, I've been mulling this over for a while now, or Paul, I hear you, but I'm not ready right now to make that decision. Agrippa has been thinking about Christianity before he ever got to hear Paul. I promise you that. The Greek reads that way. In short, something was holding Agrippa back from making that decision. Oh, I can tell you a lot of theories that I have. The Bible talks about how hard it is for a rich man to get into heaven. 
the Bible talks about about looking for the looking for the the agreement of men and the praise of men. Agrippa was high up in the land. He had the Jews praising him. He had the Jews on his side. He he could lose all of his fame. He could lose everything if he became a Christian. Agrippa's not stupid. He knows he knows Judaism. He knows the prophets. He knows that he knows the claims of Jesus followers. He probably knows exactly what happened to Jesus. And I'm sure somebody showed him some of the verses that showed him that this one looks like it lines up with this. This one looks like it. Agrippa is probably toying with that, with, that, with that decision for a long, long time. This is Agrippa II, King Agrippa II. He's one of the only Herods that will actually live a full life. Now, listen to me. Just listen. But Paul wanted Agrippa and everyone there to experience the initial conversion that he had. He wanted them right then and there to get saved. He wanted everyone to know the fullness of the love, of the joy which Jesus had given him. And it's obvious that he's sincere. How many of you write letters you're kind of like an old soul and you write letters still? How many of you have ever written a letter? I don't even want to ask how many have never written a letter. But if you've ever written a letter, sometimes you sign it sincerely. Yeah. Well, let me tell you why you sign it sincerely. It comes from two Latin words. Sina, Sarah. It means without wax. It seems that when somebody was going to, uh, that when somebody was going to make a sculpture in, in Italy, sometimes they'd crack the marble. Or sometimes a piece would be taken out. So they would take wax and they would fill it in. So for the, the ones that were perfect, uh, they would pass them off as, 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 as perfect. The ones that were really perfect, they would sign, the artist would sign, Sina Sarah, without wax. Sincerely. Paul is sincere. It's without anything added. It's his pure love for God. He's sincerely telling what's happening. Pure motives. So we understand what's going out. An example that he had too much to, to give up could be found in other parts of Scripture. We know the parts very well. An example was found in a wealthy young ruler mentioned in Luke 18, 18 and 23. The love of his wealth kept him from obeying Jesus. Another example is mentioned in John 12. Yet at the same time, many even among the leaders believed in Christ. But because of the Pharisees, they would not confess their faith for they feared they would be put out of the synagogue. For they loved praise from men more than praise from God. That's Agrippa's problem. He loves praise from men more than God. I think he was right, ready to become a Christian. And I think the problem was that he loved the praise of men more. Agrippa wasn't ready for such a message. Acts goes on in chapter 26 and tells us this. It says, The king arose, and by the way, once he rises, the trial's over. And with him, the governor and Bernice and those sitting with them. So they all rise up. They left the room. And while talking with one another, they said, This man is not doing anything that deserves death or imprisonment. This is the first time that someone says... Let's let him go. He's, he's not guilty of a thing. Agrippa's making the statement. And Agrippa said to Festus, this man could have been set free. He said, I would have set him free if he had not appealed to Caesar. This was Paul's way, directed by Jesus, of getting a free ride to Rome. Remember, Jesus had told him in, this pet, in the last chapter that he's going to bring him to Rome. So when he stands up, it's indicated that the trial's over. Paul had infiltrated Agrippa's mind. Agrippa's going to set him free. No one has set him free for two years right now. Agrippa's going to set him free. His evaluation as a Jewish king was that Paul was not worthy of death and he would have released him if he hadn't appealed to Caesar. Just think about that. I wonder what would have happened to Paul if that would happen. It wasn't God's will. The king and the, and the governor had been, had been moved by Paul, obviously. The Jews had been silenced once and for all. And the Lord's appointment for Paul to step foot in the heart of Satan's kingdom, Rome, was about to happen. Paul's life will shift again, yet again, as the Lord will use this bold witness, even in the house of Caesar, as you will see, in a moment, see later in our study. For the past several chapters of Paul's arrest, we've watched Luke pen and use his favorite method of telling a story about the events in Paul's life. He tells a story. Luke paints a picture. He paints a vivid picture of Paul's courage. All around the unifying theme of the resurrection. From all of his rest, you'll see the word resurrection everywhere. It's all around the resurrection. And what it means to believe in the victorious Christ. And how that can transform anyone's life. That's Paul's message. It's our message. A, he talks to a, a Saul becomes a Paul. He speaks to a centurion. He speaks to a, a mob of Jews. He speaks to the Sanhedrin. He speaks to a Roman governor, two of them, to a Jewish king, to everybody that's listening in that, in that forum that's there. If they accept him, he says, uh, into a strong and they'll be strong and bold and they'll be faithful followers of Christ. If they just accept Christ, they'll have what he has. That was his message. But what strikes me the most as I return to it tonight is this Christ esteem that Paul has. It's powerful. We need to ex examine it in the last moments tonight. And how we all need to see ourselves, not with self-esteem, but with Christ-esteem. So let me ask you, 
how do you view yourself? If I were to ask you, what do you think about yourself? What would come out of your mouth? Do you do you, would you say, I'm full of flaws? I'm unworthy? I'm lacking in talent? I'm unsure of myself? I'm less than adequate? I know people would say that because they say, oh, I wish I had his talents. I wish I could play the guitar like he plays the guitar. I wish I could sing like she sings. Why do we do that? Why do we do that? Listen, do you have a low self-esteem? There are signs to indicate if you do, by the way. If you're suffering from a low self-esteem, you can't make a decision. You have a need to be perfect. You feel shame at times. You see criticism many times. You have negative thoughts. You worry a lot. And you have uh, irrational, irrationally afraid of new situations. There's other things to identify the signs of low self-esteem. Poor risk taker. Afraid of competitions or challenges. You're sarcastic non-assertive, you lack initiative, and you're pessimistic. That's a low self-esteem. And as I'm saying that, it's very quiet in here. <laughs> because to some degree or another, almost all of us suffer from a low self-esteem. Uh, we've seen people succeed around us. We've seen siblings do better than we've done. We've seen people do better in careers. And our self-esteem goes down more and more every time we see the success of someone else, even though we may be happy for them. So as Christians, you can override your low self-esteem if, and only if, you have Christ's esteem. Here it is. Seeing ourselves not through other people's eyes, or even through your own eyes, but seeing ourselves as Jesus sees us. Self-esteem versus Christ's esteem. When you base your value and worth off of what others think of you, that's self-esteem. But when you derive your value and worth from Jesus, that's Christ's esteem. He's the rock, so your emotional state will be steady. But if you base it off the world, it will be unstable. If you think of how much you failed Christ, you're looking at your own self-esteem. You're not seeing how he sees you. If you can only see how Christ sees you. My self-esteem is secure when it's based on the opinion of Christ, not the opinion of others. Do you know how many people agree with me? A whole bunch. Do you know how many people don't agree with me? Quite a few. Do you know how many people say nasty things to me when I teach on, on all I'm trying to do is get people to a next step in their life and, and help them. And you know how many people will take, take umbrage with that and go against me? Well, do you think that hurts me? Well, I could, but I know I'm doing it for God. I know How many people went against Paul? There's a difference between self-esteem and Christ's esteem. How many are getting this tonight? You must grasp it. And you must grasp this. You have to accept yourself. Now, I'm not saying accept, your, accept yourself in sins that you're doing. I'm not saying that. You've been forgiven of your sins. Some people can't get over the sins they've been forgiven of. You've been forgiven. How many times will God forgive you of a sin? It's unlimited. That doesn't mean you go and sin, so grace abounds, God forbid, Paul says. But you don't keep beating yourself up. Come on, somebody say amen. You take war against something that's warring against you. You don't beat yourself up. When you feel low, remember who you are in Christ. Remember how Jesus uh, sees you, how he feels you, about you. So when you're feeling low, ask yourself this question. Looking through the eyes of Jesus, how does Jesus see me? Do you think Jesus sees you as a foul-up? As someone who misses the mark? Do you think he sees you as someone who's never going to be, never going to be accomplished in will? How did he see Peter? Peter was such a mess up, it wasn't even funny. Peter, most of the time, had his feet in his mouth. And Jesus saw him as something he was going to be. He said, he said when you're converted, strengthen your brothers. When you're converted, that means I'm seeing you down the line. I see what I have for you. So how do you see yourself? Let me tell you something. The world's all messed up. We, have, we live in a nation right now that's split up by liberal and, and, and conservative, black and white. You know what that is? That's people trying to push some self-esteem on someone. We are individuals. We are all made in God's image. He doesn't care if you're black, you're white, you're purple, or you're green. He could care less. He made you that way specifically because he loves you. He sees you the same as he sees me, as he sees anyone else. The love of God is a universal love. It makes us all level at the cross. There is no lower person of any type in, America, in the world in God's eyes. Now, you're listening to me tonight. Listen, how does Jesus see you? So this is, is going to be a, a push-up for your, for your character tonight. I want you to know that. You want to know how he sees you? Here's what God says about me and God says about you. You're loved. You're valued. God says you're beautiful. Beautiful are the feet of those. Come on, you're beautiful. You're forgiven. You're God's masterpiece. And you're redeemed and set free. If you think you're less than that, then you're calling God a liar. If you think you're anything less than this, 
then you're saying, God, you weren't capable enough to make me like this. Every one of us. How many are with me tonight? All right, get ready. So you want to pray some prayers? I'm going to give you a couple tonight. Dear Lord, when feelings of inferiority, insecurity, and self-doubt creep into my heart, help me to see myself the way you do. Don't see yourself the way your boss sees them sees you. Don't see yourself the way that enemy sees you. Don't see yourself the way that somebody who's a detractor sees you. Don't see yourself the way somebody who's prejudiced sees you. Don't see yourself the way you see you. See yourself the way God sees you. Trust me, you're going to go out of here with a smile. Because you know what Jesus thinks about you? As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. That's Jesus' words. He loves you just like the Father loves him. It's pretty powerful. So who are you in Christ? You are loved by God, you're forgiven. You're set free, you're protected by God. You're of worth, and you are victorious. Maybe we need to memorize that and say it every, time, every day to ourselves when we get up. So we understand. So I told you, I promised you I'd give you a prayer. And I do have a prayer for you. Here it is. God, thank you for accepting me even when I have trouble accepting myself. Help me to acknowledge the good qualities you've given me and to keep my flaws in perspective as I find my confidence in you. You know what we need today? We need confidence. We need the joy of the Lord. We need the passion back. We need to stop believing everything that's negative about ourselves. We need to stop believing all the negative things that the enemy throws at us. We need to stop believing whether it comes out of our mouth or our minds or somebody else's mouth or mind. We need to, come, we need to go into Christ's mind. Let his mind be in you, which is in Christ Jesus, Paul says. To think, think about Paul. He's standing in front of two of the most powerful men in the world. And he says to them, it's amazing. He bowed over. He can't barely see. He's probably, he says he's not eloquent in speaking. And he says, you know, King Agrippa and Festus, and he probably doesn't say this, but he's probably very passionate. The only thing I wish is that both of you were like me. <laughs> I love it. I just love it. Would you stand with me tonight? So, with heads bowed, let me ask a question. Just an honest question. How many came in here tonight and you weren't feeling really good about yourself? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. You're feeling maybe you failed God, or maybe that uh, you have some flaws and you're not sure you can... Come on, raise your hand. Everybody's bowing their head. doesn't matter. Hands going up everywhere. Listen, see yourself as God sees you. He loves you. What a great pickup for our spirits. Understand that God has a great destiny for every single one of us. He loves us. He has a purpose for you. You know, when I was going in high school and, and when I was in grade school, I was the biggest goof-off in the school. I got away with it because I... I didn't have to study. I had a memory that I can read something and I don't have to study. Well, that was good and bad because it put me far ahead of the classmates that I had. So I was, when they had to do all their homework, I was done with mine in no time and I started to goof off. So I was the clown of the class. You know what all my teachers told me? Almost every one of them, you're never going to amount to anything. You know what? I never believed it. <laughs> I never believed it. For somehow down the line, I just knew that, I don't know how, but I never believed I wasn't going to amount to anything. In my, in my graduating class, I graduated with 975 kids. Joe Madden, the uh, owner, of the, uh, the um, manager of the Cubs, was one of my best friends. We both played baseball together. He was really not that good. I did drugs, he did baseball. We went separate ways. I remember seeing Joe Madden at, uh, at one of our uh, reunions, and he came and he said, Mark, he said, I, I heard what's happened in your life. He knew us, Pastor. They actually asked me to pray at the reunion. And he said, what happened? And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I always knew you had potential. I said, Joe, it's not potential. It's Jesus. And I remember telling him, there's nothing in my life that I can, I can say is worth anything other than Christ. And he looked at me and I could tell he, he knew I had something that he didn't have. I could tell it. Let me tell you something. You have something the world doesn't have. So tonight, I'm going to pray that you understand yourself in God's eyes. Father, I thank you tonight. I pray, Lord God, that every single one of us would look at ourselves through the eyes of Christ. Lord, it's not to give us an excuse to do wrong, but it's to let us know that when we ask for forgiveness, Lord, you're right there. You love us with a passion, Lord God, like we never sinned. And I'm thankful tonight, Lord God, that you justify us just as if we've never sinned, Lord God. You look at us pure as your Father looks at you. I pray tonight that our Christ esteem is elevated this week, this month, Lord God, the rest of our lives, and Lord, that we wouldn't bow down to self-esteem only, but self-esteem would follow under Christ's esteem. Bless those who have raised their hands tonight. Thank you, Lord God, for being such a great God to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you.